Like the orgies knocking at my door. No. I, guess. I mean, where are they? Because where are they, the orgies? They are not. They're not here. Welcome back to my channel. So excited to have you. Wendy Renee here. Today we're talking with our friend Karen. She is a TikTok star. If you are not following Karen on TikTok, you absolutely have to go follow her. She has this gift for turning all of our stories into works of art on TikTok. And she is a wonderful content creator and activist. And one of the reasons why I really wanted to invite her on the show is because sometimes as activists, you get really caught up in helping other people or entertaining other people. And it's important to know why or what our story involves. And I know that as Karen tells her story, you're gonna find yourself in her story as well. I know I did. So let's go. Before we begin, I wanna thank you so much for liking, sharing, and subscribing. It, it, again, I say this in every video, but it's just true that there is positivity and hope on the other side of high control religion and narcissistic abuse. And if you're new to my channel, just know that you are going to be okay. Oh my God, Karen, should I call you Karen or Kay? What do you wanna be referred to? Karen as? is, Karen okay. is great. You're Karen with an I and I'm Wendy with an I and I'm very <laughs> yes. excited. I am so excited to have you on this channel. Thank you so much for making the time to come on. I invited you for many reasons, one of which is because in the activism world, you know, sometimes we focus so much on other people and helping others that sometimes our story can get lost. So we're really happy to have you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. I, I'm truly flattered to be invited to come here and chat with you today. Honestly, I started doing the TikToks for fun and maybe, you know, a little bit for myself to get stuff out of my system. Um, and it's really just turned into a great thing for me and mm -hmm. for others. So, so I um, was raised as a Jehovah's Witness. I was not born into the religion. My mom converted around the time that I was about four or five years old, I think was when she got baptized. Mm -hmm. My mom was raised in a pretty traditional religion, Presbyterian, I'm not sure. Um, and Jehovah's Witnesses knocked on her door when I was a child. Mm -hmm. And it was shortly after the loss of her dad and her mom was very sick um, and would soon die shortly thereafter. So Jehovah's Witnesses knocked on her door, she joined the religion, and I was raised as one until I became inactive about six years ago. For me, I mean, growing up Jehovah's Witness and seeing people who were apostate, um, you know, they would protest the conventions. Yes. And it yes. was, you know, scary. <laughs> yeah, anyone who grew up Jehovah's Witness knows those people and they were scary to me as an active Jehovah's Witness. But um, yeah, about six, seven years ago, um, a friend of mine had introduced me to, you know, some YouTube videos and asked that I check them out. And I was already kind of struggling in my, I guess, participation in Jehovah's Witness activities going out in service, going to meetings, everything was kind of slowing down. And at first I was incredibly nervous about looking at ex Jehovah's Witness content because of everything you're told not to do. Um, but I, I gave it a shot and it was very interesting to me. And it wasn't this big, scary monster. <laughs> you know, this person talking to me on YouTube was not this scary monster. They were people who were very dedicated to the organization, incredibly knowledgeable, and they weren't coming at it from a place of, you know, hate or anger, but really just presenting the facts and why they felt the way they did about the organization and showing things in black and white, you know, here's what they say they believe, here's the actual facts that don't back that up. And that's when things really started to click for me. And then information about, you know, the lawsuits um, around child abuse was becoming pretty widespread in the news. And that just tore me to pieces. And I, the more I continued to learn and the more things I saw like that, the more I, I really started to reflect on how I felt about 
the the teachings of the organization and how they really conflicted with who I was as a human being um, was ultimately what just led me right out of it. I so it, were you chemo at this point? Were you? Um, yeah. So. So I was, so I kind of, I I don't know that I ever really entered like a PMO state because I was already like going inactive as this was happening. Um, So it was kind of simultaneous. Like I would attend a meeting every now and then. I think I went to a couple more memorials but it was very difficult for me to be there. So I wouldn't even describe myself as PIMO because sitting there, it it was so infrequent Mm -hmm. and, (laughs) you know, so I wasn't really like physically, physically in. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, there finally came a point where I attended a convention for half a day and I said, this is it. Like I'm, I am never coming back to this. And after that, you know, I would have friends pop up and say, would you just come with me to like sit with me? And I'm like, I can't, like, I simply cannot sit in that chair and try to pretend like everything is okay. I would rather spend my day doing quite literally anything else. Right. And some of your videos on TikTok, you're very open about having been married and in the organization and then going through divorce. You also talk a lot about your mom, which one of, which is one of the reasons I was drawn to you because I feel like we had the exact same story, which I'm finding many of us did having that issue. And when you were a JW in the nineties and the two thousands, it was pumped into you 24 seven. There was, it was relentless. Yep. So um, what was that like for you? Were you married young and then did you wake up while you were married? Um, if this is too personal, no, let me know. No, okay. it's good. Yeah. So I was married young. I married at the age of 19, almost 20. I turned a few, uh, I turned 20 a few months after uh, I was married. And uh, yeah, my ex and I were married for almost 15 years. We divorced just shy of our 15th anniversary. And at the time, I don't think I recognized that us going into this divorce had anything to do with my internal conflict in being in the organization. But, you know, our marriage was good, overall good. But when you get married young, 19, which is a baby, I see 19 year olds and I think, oh my gosh, they're just babies. Right, right. Yeah, you know, you marry this person, but then, you know, 15 years go by and you're not, you're not the same person. And there were moments in the marriage that I was unhappy and I was also a Jehovah's Witness. And so I realized there's nothing like I can't do anything. And it wasn't as though I disliked him. It was just that things weren't things weren't making me happy. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the divorce also simultaneously occurred to, you know, me having these doubts about the religion and going through, there was just a lot of turmoil inside me and it was very, very difficult. And my mom at the time didn't help matters because here I am newly separated. I'm trying to find comfort in my mom because she was at one time my age she's been divorced and she would just quote scriptures or tell me maybe you should think about going back to the meetings maybe you should pray more and all I really wanted was for her to be my mother um, and relate to me as a woman, it like everything just kept compounding and her doing that just really had such an effect on me because I thought this religion is turning my mom into like, not a mom. (laughs) I don't know how to explain it, you know, like this, this religion consumes her. And at one point 
she said to me, well, you know, if you get divorced, because when I got divorced, it wasn't, I didn't have spiritual grounds for divorce. I was divorcing because I was unhappy. Mm -hmm. Um, and my mom said to me, well, you don't want to be single forever. Do you, (laughs) because you know, you're not supposed to get remarried if you don't have spiritual grounds. And I said to her, who says I'm going to be alone forever? Like those are not my rules anymore. Um, and so even if you wanted to be single forever. Yeah. I'm like, exactly. So it just, yeah, all of that, all the emotion. And, and when all of that was happening, it gave me so much perspective on the organization. And I'm like, they, they would rather people be unhappy and just keep plugging along in the religion and doing what they're told. And I'm like, this is not, this is not healthy for people. I, my, my journey out of the organization is just so layered because I feel like it was just kind of like one thing after another. And I'm like, you know what? I just, I'm, I'm fed up. So, but yeah, my ex, my ex and I were both inactive at the time. Um, we did not divorce because of, you know, doubts I was having or anything of that nature. You know, it just is what it is when you get married as a baby sometimes. Exactly. And they don't make room for that. And if you're unhappy, it's something you're doing wrong. Hence the pray more, go to meetings more Yeah. or, you know, and it's interesting because um, I follow the username Lar- Larchington on uh-huh. Twitter. He posts a lot of watchtower articles from the 60s stuff that in the 80s and the 90s the elders in the congregation were still kind of abiding by where women's place a woman's place is to be happy no matter what just serving her husband and serving her god and if you deviate from that that is an internal problem with you and when you're groomed to think that way it rocks your world especially Mm -hmm. so what did this look like for you you're like no more knowing you would lose everyone. I think by the time I, so from that moment in time for my divorce, I I really remained inactive and somewhat quiet about my feelings on things. My mom and I would have conversations, but I never said outright, I want nothing to do with this anymore. But, you know, I told her one time to stop sending me Jehovah's Witness related links and materials because she would send me the daily text and (laughs) I had to ask her to stop. And Uh then one time time she came to visit and she wanted to watch a DVD on how to find true love. This was post-divorce. And I said, absolutely not. And another time she called and she asked, if I thought Armageddon was right around the corner and I said no and she got upset and you know she said she was just sad because none of her kids would be would make it through Armageddon and be in paradise with her there were those times that I would say those kind of things but I don't think my mom I think she just thought Karen's going through it like she'll come around she'll come back you know she asked me to the convention and I went to a half a day and that that was the last one I ever went to, Mm -hmm. but it wasn't until last year, last summer that I was on TikTok and I started to come across more and more ex Jehovah's Witness content. You were the first, one of the first creators I came across and I fell in love with your content and, you know, I found some other, you know, ex Jehovah's Witnesses and I would comment and I would engage because I enjoyed the content. And finally, last summer, I thought, you know what, like, I want to talk about this. Come what may, I know that the risk is my mom will get wind of these and I will immediately be labeled an apostate because as soon as you start publicly putting out there your feelings on the organization and where you stand, I mean, Mm -hmm. that's kind of the line in the sand. Mm -hmm. Up until that point, I think she had had hope for me. And she had kept in contact with me. I think that's why it took me a long time to finally decide to be outspoken because I knew what was at stake. Um, My mom and I were very close. We would speak all the time. um, And I certainly didn't want to lose that. And that's what keeps a lot of people in. And like just in the religion altogether because many people, especially if you grow up in it, 
that is your entire support system. That is everyone you know, because you're told not to make friends out, close friends outside the religion. You can have your coworkers or your schoolmates, but you can't have close friends. And so people tend to stay right where they are because of the fear. And the fear is real. I mean, even when I was married and not happy and I thought, well, if I do get a divorce, like what's going to happen? And I would just be sick to my stomach even thinking about the repercussions. Um, Because it kind of never leaves you. You know, if you think back on the thing, if, if I remember people who were inactive in the congregation or women who did get divorced and you didn't really know the story you heard through the gossip mill bits and pieces of it. Right. There were always preconceived notions. There was always this stigma. So you get on TikTok, you start telling your story. And I, I also would like to address the balls it took to get on TikTok knowing, <laughs> knowing what would happen because it almost feels immediate. I remember posting my first video and just my stomach was just churning. And then it was in 24 hours. I had a text message from someone who was completely just shocked because I didn't give any warning. They thought I was, because I don't live in the same state that I grew up in the religion. Yeah. So they just thought I was doing my thing. And then I show up <laughs> on TikTok. So yeah, me, surprise. Me, yeah. And a lot of people who label us as apostates, they have no idea what it takes to find out what we know, try and go through all the stages of denial, anger. Yeah. This is not happening. This not my beloved religion, not for a second. And then to finally get to that point where you like, no, 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 I need to talk more about this. So yeah. can you talk about the bravery and just kind of the feeling it took for you to finally hit that record button and post it? <laughs> yeah, it was, you know, I was just sitting outside one afternoon and <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I mean, I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed everyone's content that were ex Jehovah's Witnesses and I admired them so much. And there's so many knowledgeable content creators on the app that I just thought, okay, let's do this. And as I was talking through it, I was nervous and I debated posting. I really, really did. And it was just kind of one of those okay, we're going to do it moments. Yes. Um, you know, and I felt better. Like once I started connecting with people and people saw my videos and commenting and, you know, ultimately became a formal <laughs> member of the extra was witness community, just the open arms that I was received with made so much, such an impact on me that I, like it soon went away. And mm -hmm you know, I just kept posting and kept talking. I learn a lot by watching the way that you do this is you seem to have a lot of active JWs commenting on your feeds. One of the things that's amazing about you is that you respond with class understanding and you seek to educate them. And that is, I have to say, one of the most beautiful ways of clapping back. So what did you decide to do that rather than, listen, I, I could be pretty sarcastic if I want to be. I know that you could put someone in their place. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, sometimes my jersey does pop out. Let's not, <laughs> let's not kid anyone, you know, yeah. but uh, what did you decide to just say, you know what, I could see you need my attention, so I'm going to give it to you, and it's just really great the way that you handle it, because if they're pee me, and they're watching your content, there's something there, isn't there? There is, there is, and I mean, the amount of active Jehovah's Witnesses that I see in other people's content and I yeah. see repeatedly yes. mm -hmm. really makes me wonder because mm -hmm. even though they vehemently defend the organization, they keep coming back and back and back. And I think there's something to be said about it. Mm -hmm. I think that they are curious and maybe it's Maybe they're experience, experiencing and not saying that they're having some cognitive dissonance mm -hmm. because everything presented to them in my videos, in other people's videos, it's all laid out for them. It's all in print. We're happy to show proof. We're not these lying apostates as mm -hmm. the organization would have people believe. Mm -hmm. So there, there's 
there's hope. And while they can be a little aggravating because they, tr they troll and I think they try to get us riled up. And I think that they want us to be that angry apostate that they've always been told about. Mm -hmm. And I figured the best way to combat that is to show them that we're not. I'm a real person. I, I'm not going to be angry and I'm not going to be mean to you unless you just need to have a snarky comment thrown your way. Um, unless you're disrespectful, then yes, absolutely. Yeah, yes, absolutely. So and you mentioned earlier in the interview, you mentioned that you remember seeing, it's in the 90s, like going to these big stadiums. They, the apostates were like sandwich yeah. boards. I remember going oh, to a yeah. memorial. And right before closing prayer at the memorial, this guy stood up and he's screaming at the top of his lungs right after the memorial. And I, I would say something like that may have set my awakening back even farther. Yeah. So I love that you approach it in that, in that way. Like the, the, the way that they, we are taught that apostates are scary and angry. First of all, there's nothing wrong with anger. Anger has no. its place. Yeah. So you know, to, to, to emote on social media is the brand of some creators, but for the most part, there's nothing wrong with being an angry, you just lost everything. So right. of course you're going to be yeah. angry, but the yeah. way that you go about it is, is just, it's beautiful. It really is. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. And the way you tie in pop culture and the yeah. sounds, like, yeah. it's brilliant. So yeah. Thank you. And, so after you get on TikTok, did you suffer any ramifications? Were you disfellowshipped or where, what's your current situation? So I am not disfellowshipped, faded when I left the organization and never thought to contact the elders to formally disassociate myself. Mm -hmm. It honestly was just never, in my opinion, worth my time. I didn't feel like I owed them any answers. I was disfellowshipped back when I was 16 and went through a judicial community uh, committee meeting and got reinstated. So I know what that's like. And I thought to myself, is that really something I want to do as a grown adult to go sit in the back room with, you know, three men and mm -hmm. explain my position on things or even go so far as to write them a letter? I just didn't didn't feel that I needed to give them any more of my time. Mm -hmm. But since posting TikTok videos, really the only thing that has happened is losing the relationship with my mother. She never came out and said anything to me about the videos, but my gut has always told me that someone shared a video with her. That's really just the, the biggest thing that has changed. My mom um, and my stepdad are active in the religion. I have no other family that's in the religion, but because of the religion, I never got to know my extended family. Um, my sister, who now lives a few hours from me, is m my biggest supporter. We've grown close since my divorce there's a bit of an age gap she's 10 years older so we didn't really grow up um we didn't really grow up together so I have my sister she was never a Jehovah's Witness and so I <laughs> I really just am so thankful to have her because you know my mom no longer speaks to me I don't hear from my stepdad um, I have a younger brother who's not a Jehovah's Witness, um, and we speak occasionally, but there's a 15-year age gap between us, so we're not, we're not close either. And then my stepbrother, I believe, is he's inactive, last I heard, but he's still very much in, because I did share with him via text message that, you know, I no longer wanted any association with the organization, and he essentially just said, I'm sorry to hear that. You know, I hope that Jehovah reaches your heart and he'll come back or something like that. Does your mom still talk to your other siblings, even though they were never fully in it? So my sister and my mom do not have a relationship, which is a whole story in and of itself. <clears throat> my mom does have a relationship with my little brother who was never baptized. He doesn't do anything in the religion whatsoever. He has, for lack of a better word, been quite a troublemaker. But my mom welcomes him with open arms into her home. 
you know, he was never baptized. So in her eyes, it's not the same as what I'm doing because I, I was baptized. So she's somehow able to excuse things for him saying, well, he never dedicated himself to Jehovah. So he gets a pass, but yes, they, they do have a relationship. Um, I, I follow him on social, we're friends on social media and not long ago. I mean, he was at their house, like he traveled out of state and stayed with them and you know, everything's fine. Oh my gosh. And it's the fact that, you know, I, I could take, for example, someone in my family agrees with me and they'll be vocal about it with certain members of the family, Mm -hmm. but because I'm public about it, that's where the cutoff is. Someone in my family can be completely secretive about that, the fact that they feel the exact same way, but just because I speak publicly, that means I do not get my family. I do not, you know, get that love. Right. Um, So what does life look like for you now? Now that sadly you have lost that relationship. And I'm really sorry to hear that. So many people, if you're watching this and you can relate to that story, Karen is spot on when she says that that is the reason why people stay, even if they don't believe it, because that's what they hold over us is our family and friends. They weaponize them and they villainize us. Yeah. So what does life look like for you now? What is your outlook? And um, maybe talk a little bit about your healing journey and how you got to this point. Sure. So, I mean, life for me, pretty uneventful. I live (laughs) a very, very quiet life. I live a very (laughs) quiet life. I mean, that, that's the other thing too, that I want to touch on that. There's a misconception that, you know, people leave the organization because, oh, they just want to party and they want to spin and who knows what else. Let me be honest with you that like, I'm usually, (laughs) I'm here with my dog most of the time. (laughs) I I like it could not be less exciting um but but I think with that comes that in and in and of itself brings me so much happiness and relaxation that I can choose to do things on my own terms I don't have to you know get up early on Saturday mornings and Sunday mornings my two days off a week to spend time at the kingdom hall um I very much enjoy my quiet little life. I relocated to another state a couple of years ago during the pandemic, um, which has been a refreshing change. I lived in Arizona for most of my life and that was where my Jehovah's Witness life was. And so I moved to a new place. I'm near my sister and I really like it. Like the change of scenery has been very therapeutic for me in a way. You know, I was just talking to someone recently about that because they're also trying to change their life, but they're, they, they just go about their normal routine and they'll see people that they knew from their congregation out in service or in the grocery store. And, you know, one of the things my therapist helped me to appreciate is that you cannot heal in the very place that got you sick. So I agree with you in that sometimes if at all possible, a change of scenery, changing the location, even if it's out of the territory can be so psychologically beneficial when you're deconstructing. Um, yeah. One of the things I also find interesting about um, what you said is that when it's not in your face, you know, the fact that your whole life was in Arizona and now you're in an entirely different state, mm-hmm. there is so much. Um, I, I think one of the confusing times is when you aren't part of busy culture anymore. The yeah. fact that you can sleep in on a Saturday and removing yourself from that guilt. Because yeah. you're, first of all, the world itself right now, there's busy culture. And one of the biggest challenges for me, and I don't know if you experienced this too, was my self-worth was wrapped up in how busy I am, because that's where the, you're, that's where you're rewarded in the organization, especially as women, you know, always plenty to do. And the work of the Lord right. is always, you know, if you're not, <laughs> yeah. if you're not in service, you should be cleaning the kingdom hall. If you're not cleaning the kingdom hall, you should be serving your husband. So having a calm, quiet, holistic life, mm-hmm. It's probably one of the hallmarks of apostasy. <laughs> it, I mean, it's, honestly, yeah. honestly, yeah, yeah it's yeah. not party central. I mean, no. at least for me personally, but no. yeah. I don't have I any mean, orgies knocking at my door. No. I, guess. <laughs> I mean, where are they? Because where are they, the orgies? They're not here. So for all of you people in the audience who are wondering what we're doing with our free time, I mean, I love me some Netflix and some Hulu and I can I go do. a little crazy and maybe I'll drink a White Claw or a Truly. That's... <laughs> You know, I get, I get a little insane here. <laughs> I know. I mean, it's wild. It's totally wild. But yeah, I mean, there was, 
I mean, there were times where, you know, not being at meetings, I'm like, well, what do I, what do I do with all this time? Like I was just so not used to it. And yeah, there would be times that I would just feel bad about just laying on the couch all day because I was just, you know, physically and mentally tired from the work week. And I just had to remind myself that it's okay. Like it's okay to take a break, but when you're a Jehovah's witness, it's not okay to take a break. I mean, you would make excuses ahead of time when you knew you you weren't going to be in service you know, mm-hmm. trying to come up with, oh, you know, I haven't been feeling good this week. When mm-hmm. it, in reality, you're like, I just want a day off. Because I mean, you know, heaven forbid you not be in service and someone notices and like, mm-hmm. oh, I didn't see you at right. the service meeting on Saturday. And then just the guilt that like yeah. guilt you would feel. Or if you miss the morning meeting, my mom did this to us all the time. If you're too sick to go to the morning meeting, you can't do anything no. like yeah. for, you're you cannot don't even answer the phone don't go to the grocery store <laughs> no. because the moment the congregation sees you and you weren't at the and it was just oh, I gotta like, stay busy got it's like this hamster wheel of business yes. yeah. hamster wheel. absolutely absolutely so karen someone who was what you were dealing with is undoubtedly in our audience we have women who are unhappy in their marriages and they're struggling with not having grounds and there's women who are you know just the very thought of starting over again and yeah. myself included, having gone through that, if, if, if Karen five or so years ago, or however long ago was sitting in our audience, what would you say to her right now? I think I would just want to tell her, like, everything's going to be okay. Like, oh. I think that, yeah, I would just tell her, and I might get emotional, but I would tell her like what I wish my mom would have told me when I was like, in it, like, everything's gonna be okay like Mm -hmm. you you're stronger than you think and I think that's what a lot of women who are in the organization need to hear you are stronger than you think because I I feel like we were made to feel that we that we weren't that you know we were (laughs) these fragile objects um but it's not true. Like I'm capable, you're capable. Anyone that's watching this, that is in a situation where they're not sure what to do, even if the moment isn't now, the moment will come and you can do it. And it's going to be hard and it's going to suck sometimes, but everything will be okay. Promise. I I wish I would have had you three or four years ago. My mom was the same way. That's one of the biggest reasons I wanted you on here. When you're reparenting yourself after this, it's one of the hardest things you can ever do. And I wanted yeah. them to have a clear look yeah. at the type of apostate that you really are, that there is a human being, that there is a soul behind these amazing creations that you make. And so thank you so much for your time, for coming on here, for being vulnerable. I want people to know that the bravery it takes to be vulnerable and to do this, you know, so without people like you, I wouldn't (laughs) have woken up, you know, I remember hiding under the covers, terrified of watching YouTube. And then there's women like you and we're helping the up and coming women stand on their own two feet. I woke up and I didn't have my own credit card. I didn't know what to do. And I don't ever want anyone to feel that way. And I don't have my mother either. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is a journey and it is hard. And, Mm -hmm. and that's the thing, like, and that's what I wanted people to see from the content I put out on TikTok. I am a human being. I have a sense of humor. I can find the humor in what life was like as a Jehovah's Witness. Have I been angry? Have I had my moments of anger since leaving the organization? A hundred percent. But it is important to see that like we are human beings. And if we get angry sometimes, it's totally justified. 
you know, yes. you've been yes. through so much and like so many people have been through so much. And so we have the right to be angry if we want to, but I want people to see the side of us that is really representative of who we are as, hu as human beings and that we, we do care and we do care for the people that are in it and want to leave and struggling. If I could hug everyone that leaves me everyone. comments on my TikToks every day, yeah. like I wish I could. Um, but that, that's the side of us. I want people to see because <laughs> I guess like we're, we're not the apostates of the, of the age that we grew up in, you know, screaming at conventions. And, <laughs> no, you know, like, you're not going to see us doing a kingdom hall crash. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, soon. no. So, you know, I just, and I feel like, I feel like we're doing so much good um based on comments I've received I've had someone reach out to me on my Instagram that I actually used to know in Phoenix um she was you know the daughter of someone I knew and you know she said that she's awake now and she loves my TikToks and so I mean there's there's people watching that you don't even know are watching and and, and so you just never know the impact never you're have. And we can use more creators we can yes. use more speaking out there yes. is plenty of room at the table. Don't think, <laughs> just because, don't think just because someone has X amount of followers or this person creates this kind of content, there is room mm. for everyone. There is. So if you have a camera, use it. Don't wait for the perfect opportunity. Um, if agree. you have something to say, you should say it. And that is what I want the message to be heard yep. loud and clear. Karen, we would love to have you back on maybe in the future okay. to see how you're doing. And yeah. uh, if you're not following her on TikTok, <laughs> What are you doing with your life? <laughs> it's a good time. It's a good time over there. I mean, it's mostly funny, but we have a serious yeah. conversation every now and then. But yeah, I, I love making people laugh. And I feel like laughter is the best, one of the best ways to- Well, we have just enough trauma to be the funny one, I think. I know. Just a touch. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Karen, thank you so much for coming on and, uh, we'll, we'll definitely see you next time. And again, keep yeah. creating and thank you for everything you do. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a pleasure. Um, really enjoyed talking to you tonight. Thank you so much for watching. And if you want to be on the show, go to wendyrenee.com backslash beyond the show and the schedule will pop right up. All of Karen's information is in the description box. Be sure to follow her on Instagram and TikTok. And that's all we have for today. And thank you so much for watching. <laughs>